Welcome back to Language in Perception and Thought, the Research Lab version. In this little module, we're going to be thinking about how do words relate to categories. Now, when I say word, what I mean here is symbol, a symbol in a linguistic system. So a symbol is some way of communicating that represents some element of meaning that is shared within your linguistic community. That word might be spoken or it might be signed. It still has the same functional relationship within a community of language users. The first perspective I want to bring to words is the idea of prototype theory developed by Eleanor Roche. In Eleanor Roche's work, she pioneered the idea that when we think about a word meaning, there might be some objects that belong to a category that are just better at being members of that category than others. So in her work with American university undergraduates, she asked university undergraduates to list down as many different birds as they could think of and found all sorts of interesting patterns about which birds were most commonly mentioned, how quickly people could think of particular birds, and all sorts of other secondary cognitive effects. Now, what you might have noticed if you look at this category of Eleanor Roche's American birds is that right in the center is the robin. When American undergraduates are asked to rate the birdiness of different birds, the robin gets the highest score, followed by canaries, doves, sparrows, and then lower down the list, owls, peacocks, parrots, toucans, etc., until we get to the outer ring of not very birdy birds at all, penguins and ostriches. What we need to recognize in this theory though, is if a symbol is shared among a community who use their language together, then that category structure might differ for different linguistic communities. So what I wanna show you now is some data that we've collected over the past couple of years in this class, Language and Perception and Thought. So in 2019, when we asked our uh, class to list down in 120 seconds as many different birds as they could think of. This is the outcome of their listing task. What we can see up the very top is that there are a number of birds that are ranked higher than others. Uh, the x axis in this case is the number of participants in the class who listed the same bird. And the y-axis in this case, even though the writing is very tiny, represents the names of different individual birds in order from highest to lowest. And without worrying too much about which birds those birds are just yet, what I'd like you to focus on is a few features of this distribution. The first feature is that there are only a very few words who are listed by everybody right up the top here. And in this case, we have pigeon and parrot and eagle and sparrow and crow. We have a, a graceful decline, but a very, very long tail, which means that there are lots and lots and lots of birds that only one person thought of. And these are birds like kookaburra and woodpecker and starlet. So these are much less frequently th thought of as birds in a spontaneous listing class by people in Singapore who grew up in Singapore and who speak the Singaporean variety of English. Let's zoom in a little to see uh, what this looks like in a bit more detail. So here we can see the zoomed in data and we can see that right at the top of the list we have pigeon. Singapore is a very urban environment for most of us most of the time, so the birds that we are most likely to encounter are not robins, but pigeons. We also have parrot and eagle and sparrow and crow, followed by minor, which is a very local bird to this environment. After that, we seem to get penguins, chickens, ducks, seagulls, goose, flamingo, ostrich, owl, vulture, cockatoo, hawk, peacock, 
emu, hummingbird, nightingale, swan, dove, etc., etc., etc. So when we look at this list, we seem to have a ranking here that's telling us something about the Singaporean speaker, for speakers of the Singaporean variety of English, which birds are the birdiest? Which bird is the most prototypical bird when we think of the abstract category bird? What kind of features are we thinking of? And it seems to be that pigeons are it. One feature we might like to think about though is there were some people in this class who didn't list pigeon at all. So we have to remember that although there might be group consensus on the birdiest bird, we also have the individual language user interfacing with this pattern from within their speech community or their language community that means that an individual may or may not align closely with the norms of their group. In this visualization, we're looking at the data in a different way. We're looking at the frequency with which an individual bird was listed on the x-axis and on the y-axis what we're looking at this time is what position did a bird have in an individual's list. Uh, now this is the average rank for items that were listed by more than one person. So what we can see here is that those highly frequent birds the parrot and the pigeon and the eagle and the sparrow were birds that came very early in the list of people who listed them. So they were some of the top two or top five words that a person came up with. For birds that were listed by just one person, on the other hand, so down here, this row of black dots, all of these uncommon words, these uncommon birds could come anywhere in somebody's list. So they were highly variable in their distribution in terms of ease of access to that lexical item. So what we're getting at here is something that might be telling us that it's easier to bring to mind the symbol for some birds than others. Not only do more people think of it, but the majority of people will think of it more easily in one of these free listing tasks. So there's a relationship between the community norm and the individual process of accessing these items. In this visualization, what we've done is we've taken that frequency data, that is to say how frequently different individuals in the class listed each of these different items, and we've generated a particular kind of word cloud. Now this word, in this word cloud, the size of the circle represents how many people selected an individual word. And it's a graphically engaging way that we can present this data so that you can extract something about the category structure simply from viewing the graph. So again, we can see that pigeons and parrots and sparrows and eagles are those birds that were most consistently listed by this class group in 2019. And we can say that somewhere in the middle of that bunch is something we might think of as a prototype. And then outside around the outer edge where we get these birds that were listed by just one person, we can see that these are the birds that are less frequently thought of in the category of birdie nests. Let's now do a comparison of how our class looks compared to those data we saw earlier from Eleanor Roche's undergrads in the US. And here we can see the difference. We can see that the US undergraduates have different birds at the center of their category compared to Singaporean undergraduates. So there are different prototypes at the cores of these categories and different category structures. And this brings us to a really important point. If we were to look at a dictionary of Singapore English, if such a thing existed, and a dictionary of American English, we would see all of the names of all of the birds on all of these lists listed down as extant vocabulary items. That is to say, these are words that exist in these named languages. What we wouldn't be able to see though, is how these communities differ in what they think a birdie bird is, what they think of when they invoke the category of birdhood. So 
just to bring this segment back to our interest in Worf and the Worfian hypothesis, if we think that the words that we use might cause some kind of cascade into non-linguistic processing, then we have to think about this from the perspective of the words we actually use. So you might have the coolest test in mind for uh, a relationship between a particular domain of language and a particular cognitive outcome. It might be really cool, but unless you can demonstrate that the community of language users who you intend to test actually use that linguistic feature in the way that you think they do, then your hypothesis is bound to fail simply by the logical flaw in your design. And this is why in the research lab on language and perception and thought, the first thing we do, the major project that you will do in your class assignments is to validate your assumptions about language use by collecting linguistic data from the community of people that you plan to include in your future research proposal. So that brings us to the end of this small segment on category structure and names for things.